My guest today is the incomparable Larry Wilmore. He is uh, just a lot of fun to talk to and hang out with. He's an Emmy Award winner and has been on on television and in television for quite some time as a producer, actor, comedian, uh, certainly writer uh, for more than 25 years. Uh, he was host uh, of uh, Comedy Central's The Nightly Show with Larry Wilmore. Previously, he's made his impact uh, and memorable appearances uh, as the senior Black correspondent on The Daily Show uh, with Jon Stewart and John's back. So who knows, right? Uh, he's worked on shows such as In Living Color, The PJs, The Office, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Blackish and Insecure. He also has served as a creator, writer, and executive producer of The Bernie Mac Show, which earned him a, 20, a 2002 Emmy Award for Outstanding Writing for a Comedy Series and a 2001 Peabody Award as well. He is currently the host of the podcast, Larry Wilmore, Black on the Air. My conversation with the one and only Larry Wilmore coming up right after this quick break on the Michael Steele Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome to the Michael Steele podcast. Yes, we are in the in the beginnings of the political season. We've had a few primaries. We've had a few cockeye. You didn't know the plural was cockeye, did you? Very good. Uh, you know, and we, and we've got Larry Wilmore. Welcome, bro. Hey, what's up, Michael? Thank you. It's good Thanks for having you. me here. It's good. Yeah, to I see. never heard cockeye, the plural of caucus, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's great. I thought you were going somewhere dangerous with that. <laughs> well, there, there are days that can happen. You know, it's a whole different yeah. podcast if we do that. But I know, which, you know, you never know. You may have to switch <laughs> it up sometimes. You never know. Well, it's good to have you back, man. It's it's good to have the conversation. Uh, I've enjoyed the times we've run into each other out, yeah, absolutely. out, out on the streets, as they say. Yeah. Uh, everything's going well in your world. If you Are you starting to, to digest <laughs> the the political uh environment uh and and even the global environment because yeah the and typically you know we get into a presidential cycle it's all domestic politics it's the economy yeah. and stuff like that but you've got this overlay of not mm. just one but two incredibly important uh you know, yeah. international events with israel and palestine and of course absolutely Ukraine and Russia. How are you just as as we start this uh, mm -hmm. sort of looking at the landscape right now? And what are your juicy bits that you are, <laughs> well, are focusing I, on in the work you do? Well, that's great. You know, it's funny. I don't sometimes I touch on it in the work I do. And sometimes I don't because it's hard to do topical stuff in something. So you try to think if you have a take on something that can be a little more extract into something else you know the feel of something but that's not always easy to do right. i was developing something last year it didn't quite work out but it was trying to do that but i've always been a fan of this stuff even when even before i talked about it on having a show or stand-up comedy and that sort of thing so i've always been a, an observer of it and this is this is a very unusual year like to me if we're going to compare it to something I compare it kind of to 1968, you know, I was just a huh. kid then. Um, but, and the reason why it reminds me of 1968, first of all, there were some terrible global things happening in 1968. Mm -hmm. You know, the country felt really divided. You had LBJ, who a lot of people didn't want to run and his, the left part of his party didn't like him because of the war, the left party Biden his party doesn't like him because of what's happening in the Middle East, you know, you have a, different candidates running on law and order, you know? <laughs> well, what's interesting on the first point was yeah. that left actually wound up running uh, Johnson out of the, the presidential yeah. contest. Thousand percent. Absolutely. Yeah. He looked at it and said no. And Joe Biden looked at it and go, yeah, let's see if you can catch up with me. Yeah. I mean, Johnson <laughs> said, you know, he felt when he lost Walter Cronkite, he had lost that, you know, left yeah. part of his uh, appeal or whatever it is, you know? And the parties, both parties, well, the Republican Party back then wasn't as fractured as the Democratic Party, but both parties seem to be fractured right now. Yeah. Democratic Party's a little more together, but 
they have some dangerous thing. But man, the Republican Party, your your old party, your boys. <laughs> I don't know what's up with your boys, man. It's like not even Republican Party; it's Trump Party. Yeah, which is which is crazy. You know, this when... is really a good lesson of what happens to to people when they start using. You know, it just it just is. You, you wind, <laughs> you using up... what though? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, uh, they, they legalize more... marijuana in a lot of states, but I don't know what else they've been legalizing <laughs> in these red states. They've been legalizing something else in the red states, like hallucinogens or something like that. Well, as we've learned from a number of uh, current and former members of Congress, apparently I, they like to have wild parties. So, you know, just... I, I guess, you know. <laughs> Uh, so you, you, you make a as a, as an that. observer, I look at the historical things that, uh, you know, I, I'm not so much a, a cheerleader pundit type, you know, I'm more right. of a appreciator of what's happening. And, you know, I'm a, you know, I, I'm a Democrat, so I want my side to win, but I'm not in it to, I don't observe it for that type of thing, really, you know. So in, in your in your uh, in the work that you see now um, mm. that you're doing now, you've got your podcast Black on the right. Air. You've got the work you're doing at NBC or new projects and things like oh. that. Is there is there a sense of, of pressure to particularly like in the podcast space when you start hearing you know mm. storylines about black men are you know moving towards Trump? You know mm. you kind of look at it and you go okay so. Do I really want to digest that politically or do I just want to riff on it comedically? Well, I've riffed on that before. You know what's interesting? In my podcast, I haven't done as much commentary in the past year only because things have been so divisive, Michael, that right. I just wanted a break from all of that. And just I've been doing more straight interviews. And then when I have an opinion, I'll slip it into that. You know, but because it's an election year, I'm going to go back to probably directly commenting on some of that. But some of these things I find ridiculous, honestly. You know, I've always been a proponent of I, people are allowed to have their own thoughts, you know. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. They don't have to represent a group by having their own thoughts. But also be careful when you when you say you're representing a group, because that's when you get into trouble too, you know? So if you say you're speaking for black people or you're trying to solve black issues, you, you know, you're stepping in some waters that right, you know, right. well, are not easy waters to be wading through, you know? That's not actually, that's a great point because there have been a number of folks who have stepped into uh, mm. that, that, you know, those waters and have found, there to be quicksand on the bottom or right. just really, really sticky mud. Um, <laughs> and, and, and they've gotten caught in the, in this conversation right. about what's evolving politically. And, and mm -hmm. it really kind of speaks to, you know, actually the, the, you know, analogy used going back to the 68 uh, campaign and the right. fractures that were culturally and politically driven uh, in the mm -hmm. 1960s uh, around uh, civil rights, the sexual revolution, the war, et cetera. You have those similar themes kind of playing out right. uh, now. And this, the civil rights component is, is, is sort of a little bit more expanded as, yeah, you on the one hand, you talk about, you know, the retraction of rights, voting rights, for example, mm -hmm. uh, amongst many states. Um, but then you're also talking about how African Americans are looking to push up against the political parties, right? And say, you know what? Time out. We're tired of this. You've taken us for granted, or you've ignored yeah. us, and we're gonna we're gonna reevaluate how we are assessing both parties and the candidates. And yeah, that may lead to some um, within the black community to look at Republicans a little bit differently, a look or or some. Mm -hmm. To look at Democrats a little bit differently, and so that makes a, from my perspective, it's a very good conversation to have. And as a political guy, yeah. it's something I was sensitized to as a party chairman. Um, I'm always aware of that prospect happening where uh -huh. I can get movement towards me, or I can get movement away from me. Right, and um, you know what's interesting is that a lot of times, especially the Democratic Party does this a lot they'll treat the black electorate as being in one class and it's always lower class, you know, that Interesting. They're, in need, they're, yes. in need of, they're in need of something in this relationship that they're going to provide, you know? 
But yes. that's a very shallow way of looking at that relationship. And you see a lot of young people and young energy. Some of these people are entrepreneurs. You know, they're looking for a different relationship with the government. You know, you know, they're looking to make their own mark in the world. And how? What's my relationship with the government going to be in here? I'm not looking for this old relationship where you know government's my daddy, or it's like, <laughs> or, or my uncle or something, and is. You know, or like your daddy. Yeah, or that <laughs> type of thing. Well, you know, you know, some of that kind of stuff, unfortunately, be became truer than not. But right. I think I think when you're only talking about one class, you're leaving out a lot of people and you're ignoring the realities of the current situation. You know, more black people have been educated now. You know, more black people have moved, have had the mobility happen. If we just talk about the people at the lower end, not that that's not important, Michael, right. but we're ignoring a large swath of people who are aspirational on the up and up, who want to do things differently, you know, who want to change up the game, you know. So why, um, so why what you just said is very important to me. And and by the way, for them, they may not see a relationship with either party at this point. Exactly. So, yeah. so what they're looking for, so they might disrupt the Democrat Party and get what they want out of them. Or some of them may look over to the Republican Party and see if there's something for them. They feel like there's not quite a home for them. So that's, yeah. that's kind of what the point I was making. Here. Yeah, no, and that, it's actually an excellent point because what it plays up for me while you see the Democrats sort of taking this, oh, for them, let's provide right. another program for them. And, right. and we, we are the better champion and defender of their rights than they are, right? Right. On the Republican side, it's like, okay, could y'all get your ass up and go to do something? And what's your problem? And oh, by the way, we have a really good deal on some gold sneakers, and we can protect your menthol cigarettes. Uh, and that and that was the latest the latest pitch from Trump um, in front of a group of black conservatives last Friday, mm. where instead of leaning into a narrative around what right. you just said about how Democrats perceive that relationship with the black community. Right. And, and say, well, I want to talk to you about, you know, not just the economic piece, but let's talk about how I can, my term as president will improve right. on the healthcare disparities in the community. You talked about education. Healthcare is uh, very important right. is for everybody too, you know, whether you're a startup company and you need to provide for your employees, or you are a person who's maybe right. down to luck and they need help from the government or a student. There's so many, that's one that's uh class neutral, no matter what class you're in healthcare is very important in your relationship with the government and healthcare is very important too. And it exactly is. And, and so when you, when you come to that conversation with stereotypes, right. Um, you know, menthol cigarettes and, and sneakers. So wrong. You, you 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 say to yourself, well, where do I, you know, if you're in the black community, you go, okay, so what do I do with this? <laughs> right? now, there, it's you know what it is. That to me is contempt. You know, yeah. it's not really taking somebody seriously. You know, and that is because that part of the party is a cult. That's the cult of Trump. You right. know, so Trump is he's not an idealist. He doesn't have any ideas. It's a cult. You know, he wants to be worshipped and he has to be, you have to service the relationship of worshipping him, you know. So he relates to people from that dynamic. Black people can relate to me. So it's about, <laughs> what? What are you talking about, <laughs> you know? So that's why, in my mind, there. I, where do you even start with trying to find a relationship with the Republican Party when that's the person leading? Right, it? right. I've it, done crime. Ridiculous. They've done crime. We crime together. Yes, exactly. exactly. <laughs> they, they understand me. You know, they like bling. That's what I'm giving them. You know? right. um, so, so to that extent, I mean, the, the cult part of politics is it's not a new phenomenon, but it right. is certainly a more pronounced phenomenon in this cycle. Um, you also have the cultural influences on um, politics. How how does what we see on TV, what we stream onto our phones, um, influence and impact the 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 nation's politics as well as the nation's culture? I mean, is there is there a, a disconnect there, or is is or is it so simpatico that it's a, a sort of a seamless 
bond between the two and they they mm -hmm. properly reflect back one or the other yeah i've never thought television was an influencer so much as a reflector oh, okay. you know, i've always felt and that's interesting yeah to me I, I remember i broke this down once i felt like art is usually like about 100 years ahead you know theater is usually about maybe 10 or 20 you know music is very close to to zeitgeist to contemporary to now you know mm -hmm. tv is about 10 years behind <laughs> <You know? laughs> movies are about usually good movies are usually maybe 10 or 5 years ahead right you know? right so but music is close close to where it is um that's why music evokes more uh, rich memories from people because it reminds them of specific times it's so entwined in times you know right where movies can be all over the place you know but art it can be like a hundred years ahead you know yeah it, like it's so out there that it takes a hundred years for us to understand it you know but tv yeah. is usually reflect tv is rarely rarely leads the way there have been a couple of examples where it has where i think programs have been leading leading the culture rather than reflecting it and responding to it so I think what TV does is respond to it. But now we have a new medium, social media, which we haven't had to deal with before. So social media, to me, I think is more of an influencer than traditional media. Um, because social media is in a different relationship with people, mm -hmm. you know. And I think um, culturally, um, a lot of the left, and you've dealt with this a lot too, kind of has controlled the media since the 70s, pretty much. Before that, the right kind of controlled the media yeah. and was the arbiter of standards and the culture and all that stuff. And the left kind of slowly took that over. So a lot of that, um, you know, seeps through social media. So that's why there was a big disruptor when Elon Musk took over Twitter, because a lot of that was right, you know, that, you know, a lot of that was left culture that was kind of leading that with right you know a little bit of right kind of sneaking in here and there but it certainly wasn't even i think you know and then it you know this toppling was so disruptive to people because everybody what's normal to people is the left leading the way in the culture you know i'm not saying whether they're right or wrong with that lead but right. that's the, there's influence in social media with that more so than television you know um, there may have been a time when television had a little bit of influence, but I don't think it does the way that people think it is. So, I, I, so those that... new, so the news and all that stuff, you know, maybe some for older people, but what's really influencing people are, is their relationship with social media and how that leads, which is why people were so interested in Facebook and what was going on in Facebook during that last election that they felt nobody talked about TV commercials being wrong or having misinformation, right? It was all about true. Facebook saying wrong things. Well, why? True. How come we're picking on Facebook and not that ad that was so horribly wrong on on the news? Because nobody cares about that. No but one's in a relationship you, with that. You know? But then, but then, Larry, you you do have the the cultural moments where, for example, Roseanne Barr and and that in that situation that where her politics kind of bled into her show so i guess in that sense i see what you're yeah, saying yeah but she got in trouble but what by what she said on twitter right it wasn't not by what, what she, she said on the, on the show. show and that's exactly your point. that's your point got nobody it. cared what she said on the show but they cared what she said on twitter and so my question then, <laughs> yeah, that's true but but then <laughs> that's my point <laughs> but what if you did say it on the show what if you did say it on the show what do you think the reaction would be if you took some of the stuff that you say that you see on twitter and that was part of a, a dialogue or a script. Well, now you need people who are willing to put that on a show. Ah, ah, yeah. You and know. that person doesn't exist. In, 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 Not a lot of them. There's some uh, of it. At least they want, if they want to work, they don't exist. Well, Roseanne would have the power to probably put that on the show. Well, I don't know if it's that hostile. It's just that it's it's a different, it just feels foreign to people, you know, a lot of that that point of view, you know. Like, I've always been more in the middle than people realize. And I remember doing the PJs, we had some things that, mm -hmm. you know, they, they kind of questioned the PJs for some people, it was an animated show mm -hmm. uh, with Eddie Murphy, they were in the projects. And I had a lot of lines that were kind of going against what people would kind of accept or think, because we were doing a satire on right. that. So one of the lines that I had, 
it was uh, for HUD and it was the slogan for HUD. And it said, HUD, keeping you in the project since 1965. <laughs> and that was a satirical line. And they were like, well, what do you mean by that? I'm like, I mean exactly what it says. You know, that's what do you mean? What I, <laughs> you know? But, but because and it it's did, still funny today, folks. <laughs> yes, because it didn't sound like it was supposed to be that, you know, when I, uh, you know, and did the White House correspondence, and I took a couple of jabs at Obama. Like, oh, yeah. How, how dare you? How dare you make jokes about a sacred Obama? I'm like, he's a politician. You're supposed to make jokes about everybody. I make jokes about everybody. He's one of them. You know? He's one of them, right? Yeah. Well, that, that does. Sort of, it's funny how you, 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 you raise that because it's it's interesting that there's some persons and institutions that people are like oh no 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 you can't that you can't that's it's almost like they're sacred cows unto themselves right right right, 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 right. Um, i don't know if that hud falls into that category but there are there are institutions out there that that have really bright lines around them and yeah. unless they do something to really kind of muck it up for themselves so yeah. you know the catholic church could be verboten oh until you get to sex abuse and then then you kind of you now you kind of create it right. you diminish the line and created a, a a break uh that people can now come in and make fun or uh, you know any other group or institution that falls down that road so mm -hmm. it's always a very careful track for social commentators like yourself and those who kind of reflect what's going on and sort of mm -hmm. give a different view of it that that the country may not have seen or heard before to be mm -hmm. careful in how you you cross that line um uh, like you said with with your hud joke you cross it but it was so subtle that I'm like well, what do you mean and you're like well oh, also i don't think i'm wrong here guys <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile you're scratching your head and go is it just me or did I not but see also it? it's satire to me well satire, satire is difficult yes it's right? not easy right. it is difficult to convey there have been a lot of comedians who've been tripped up on satire absolutely um and 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 why is that is it that we do have such sensitive buttons maybe if we get to someone like a barack obama versus a donald trump or is what what do you think drives that that knee jerk response sometimes and they completely miss the satirical joke? Uh that's a big question. Um I don't know. I think you don't think it, about that when you're writing it, when you when you're in that moment and you write mm -hmm. that joke and you know it's satire and you know where you're going. Mm -hmm. Do you stop and go, I don't know if they're gonna get this? No, not so much that. To me, well, look, here, there, there are two parts to that, okay? Because we now live at a time where even if people get it, if they're grossly offended by it, you could get, be canceled in some ways, you know? Like, <laughs> like getting it isn't even the point. It's like, oh, we get it. We just hate it, you know? <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> and now we hate you. Thank and you very much. You you know? for saying it. <laughs> right. So I think the it's more like, is it even worth it to make this joke? Is probably with, with some air. Like, there are some subjects it's not even worth making jokes about. It, and it doesn't matter what side you're landing on, right. whether it appears... You know, it's just making a comment about it is enough for people to be so upset. It's it's just exhausting, you know. So for me, I tend to do things that I feel like I know, I feel like I'm more of an expert on or I have a real good take on, you know. Right. And so like with when it comes to race, when we we're doing the nightly show, you know, I have a very good take on that because, you know, I'm old enough to have seen a lot, you know. <laughs> and I always try to pick a point in there where I think there's truth that need some sunlight you know right. and truth they need sunlight it doesn't always please everybody you know but that's okay i don't mind that you know the uh you know but i think they're the reason why race upsets people on both sides many times too but it really upsets people on the right a lot because i think and i don't get this but like people used to call me divisive and all this stuff just for saying true things but a lot of people don't on the right on the right don't understand that the reason why you feel uncomfortable is because that was some fucked up shit that happened. That's it. You're, supp you're supposed, to feel, you're supposed to feel uncomfortable. It's not a bad thing, by the way. Feeling uncomfortable in this sense, it's a good thing. And acknowledging that, like people say, why can't we move past that? Well, 
you don't even know half the shit that even happened at this point yet. Like people don't, you know, like it's amazing how many things that you uncover and you realize happen just so many things that were buried in history. Yeah. Like most Americans have no idea what the true history of lynching is, Michael, in this country. No, they yeah, don't. It's a sad subject and it's an ugly subject, but my God, it happened. It happened right here, you know? And sometimes when you point those things out, people think you're being divisive and everything. It's like, no, we're being enlightening, you know? Well, uh, it, it, but that's I don't want to, I don't want to bring this stuff up for fun, you know, like right. it's a part, it's a party conversation, but sometimes you you have to illuminate things in the past to understand the present. You know, you brought up the Middle East. No one has a problem with going backwards and talking about the etymology of things or how things started because they realize it's important to talk yeah. about those things. But somehow race relations in America, we're supposed to forget everything that happened until last week when it seems like, but isn't everything okay now? Why should we think about anything? <laughs> well, but, you know, that for me, particularly over the last number of years, is is a very, um, a very profound point because what my, my take on this moment, and this moment has been with us for a while now, is a couple of things. One, to your point about people being uncomfortable, mm -hmm. they're uncomfortable for a variety of reasons, including their own um, uh, feelings about these things. Mm -hmm. May maybe maybe there is a tinge of 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 racism that they fail to admit about themselves or their family or their community that they live in. Maybe there is, uh, you know, a sense of uh, a feeling of, you know, looking at others as other. Um, and you just kind of caught them in that moment with your joke or your script or sort of, you know, doing the documentary, just putting it out there for people to see it, putting it in a historical context for them. And you can't help but then have your own self-reflection when you're watching something and, and sort of seeing it and thinking, how do you feel about that? I feel a certain way because I either identify with it or it reminds me of something about myself or somebody else who's close to me, whatever, whatever that connection is. I don't think people really want to get into those feelings. They just don't want to. So it's just easier to say it never happened or it didn't happen that way because that way requires me to respond a certain way that I don't want to respond. Or they say, I, I didn't do it, you know? The right. People in the past did that. I didn't do it. Why are you bringing it up? Right. Why are you bringing that up now? And and so, you know, I, I literally had that conversation yesterday um, with a friend and and social commentator and, and someone who's kind of in this space. And the response was, you know, when he, when he gets that, well, why are you bringing that up? I had nothing to do with it. Um, it said, no, you didn't, but your granddaddy did. And so, you know, if your granddaddy was a slaveholder, why are you so hard pressed to acknowledge that? Why are you, why are you so reticent to, it doesn't mean that we look at you or think less of you, uh, in that context, just, you know, now, now we can even more so have the conversation. But because of because of people's own personal histories and stories and things that they're proud of or not proud of, we we on matters of race just don't want to talk about it. You, yeah. you, and you look at what happened with the 1619 Project, CRT, pulling books, uh, history books off the shelves that talk about race. You're not going to place, you know, the, the legacy of slavery on my daughter's back. No, but I think it's important for your daughter to know it existed and and so that's that seems yeah. to be the struggle we're in now well i don't even make it a personal thing honestly i only deal with the role of government in it you know right and, and society well, that's, because that's crt to me, that's institutional right it's, yeah it's the most Im important aspect of it and people just focus on the slavery part but like when like when we talk about something like jim crow um to me, sometimes it's too esoteric for people to understand because they think of Jim Crow as this, you know, 
thing that maybe the government did or whatever. And okay, yeah, that was wrong. And I'm like, well, hold on a second. That was people who wrote that. It didn't just come down right. from the heavens and it was a thing. People decided that was a good thing. Well, why did they decide that? Because black was a bad thing to people, you know? Like when people, uh, when they talk about what, <laughs> I didn't think we'd be talking about white supremacy, but I want to say this in a way that, that makes sense for people. Like to me, what what white supremacy really is, it's not Nazi, KKK, it's, that's not white supremacy. That that's That's what people always think when they're, when this talk of what white supremacy is. Well, white supremacy really is, and what it was in the country, was, you know, treating blacks who were called Negroes at this time as something less than that ideal. Right. They, they weren't that ideal. And there was also, you know, some very negative feelings towards black too, that they could not mix with white people because white people were up here and black people were down there. That was not a controversial opinion. It was not controversial. Right. That was that was right. a blanket opinion. It was controversial if you did not agree with that. And mm -hmm. that's not a, a an American opinion. That was a global opinion. You know, um, the idea that white is the ideal was, uh, you know, and specifically white European. And if you really want to get specific, the British were at the top of that idea right. too. You know, <laughs> you know, if you just want to break it down, I mean, really, was that was a global opinion? You know. I mean, still, the British monarchy is considered the the top. Nobody's considered bigger than that, you know, right. in terms of of importance in the world and who who we look up to. You know, the British did a really good job of of making that stuff stick. You know, yeah, they, they, but they, so they, not bad on the branding thing. So a lot of these things that happen in around the country came out of that assumption. Now you mix in some hatred and that kind of stuff with it, of course it gets worse, but that assumption is what drives that, you know, and it, and what took a really long time, especially in this country and different parts of the world, and it's still going. And what the word equal means, it means more than people being treated the same. It's, it's being viewed as the same too, you know, that, that takes a longer time for people to understand. You know, it's that whole doll test with the white doll and the black doll yes. and that type of thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's the thing that's taken so long where we all have opinions about that. Even remember Jesse Jackson said how he's afraid of the black people walking in <laughs> instead of the white people. Even Jesse is saying that Even Jesse said been that ingrained in people for, for so many years, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so. it just it, it for me it it's kind of it, it really does fall in, in into a lot of these different buckets and you know this age that we find ourselves in now where there seems to be the confluence of of both political and cultural events that are meshing in a way that we we do it's easy to dismiss certain things or at least attempt to like race um, and focus on more of the the broader cultural uh, reflections that people have about, you know, transgenderism or, mm. you know, things like that and lose sight of that thread that's been interwoven in all parts of our societies. Yes. Even into, you know, gay and lesbian, uh, you know, issues and as well as, you know, uh, white suburban women in their small businesses, <laughs> formerly known as affirmative action. Uh, mm. You know, all of those things that kind of um, that touch on race that we don't really want race to touch on. And it, it's for me, it's kind of interesting right now that the reaction to race by folks around the country uh, is really interesting to watch uh, at this moment in time. Yeah, a lot of it, unfortunately, has been politicized so much, too. That right, easy, and that's the point. It's easy yeah. for people to take sides, because to yeah. me, it was always a human issue. I'm sad that most of it just went into one party politically. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, I was talking about this a couple of years ago, and I felt, to me, a, a critique that I have of the civil rights movement in the 60s was that it unfortunately got aligned with the anti-war movement, which is really more of a leftist movement. And the civil rights movement was a humanist movement in my right. mind. It right. wasn't a leftist or a right, right movement. It really wasn't. It, it wasn't a liberal movement. It wasn't a conservative movement. It really was just a humanist movement. But the anti-war movement really was more of a leftist movement. And 
I feel when they got aligned, this civil rights movement kind of got into that bucket, unfortunately. And I thought that was a big mistake, you know, in terms of of how things are just ingested culturally. This right. is more of a of a on a subconscious level how somebody right. views things that the struggle for something is is a political issue, not a human issue, you know. So, but before that, it wasn't considered. I mean, as many Southern Democrats were against civil rights as some as some Republicans and some Republicans were for it and some Democrats were for it because the parties weren't aligned like that back then. They right. had both parties had had conservative and liberal factions of their parties, you know, so it didn't fit neatly into one. But Johnson had to convince Democrats to pass the civil rights. Well, bill. that's that's exactly <laughs> you know? right. Well, no, that's yeah. that's exactly right. And and that merging into the the war narrative yeah. made going after it an easier target. Absolutely. You're absolutely and, right. And it then that then bled into everything that would flow afterwards um that were were part of the great society policy, the right. law and order policies of the Nixon era, um the you know the re cultural uh issues mm -hmm. that emerged during the Reagan era. By the way, the same thing happened with abortion for exactly. that abortion was both a Republican and a Democratic issue. In That's fact, right. the Republicans had it on their platform in 1972. And it was the uh, it was Phyllis Shafley or whoever it was, you know, uh, 1980. Yeah, but that I, was later. But she did all that work in the 70s. She did the turn, work in the 70s, but to it, turn it, the Republican to right. get that out of their plank, right. you know, and it was not just her. It was also the moral majority that uh, started to have more of a presence in in 1980 and removed all of that. So then abortion became a democratic a democrat issue as right. opposed to a humanist issue a this human is an issue. issue yes that women why is a, an issue with women a, a political issue that's crazy women's reproduction should not be a political issue you know it it, it really shouldn't <laughs> be and and yet here we find ourselves today on the heels of dobbs uh now embroiled right. in an ivf uh, uh debate discussion uh, right. and and culturally uh, politically, uh, women are get once again caught in that crosshairs mm -hmm. uh, when it is about their their humanity, their dignity, and their ability to make a decision for themselves. Mm -hmm. And the great irony for me, as someone who you know, uh, it was a is a pro life individual, to have that script flipped where the more libertarian leanings of our party led us. For that period you're talking about, up to 1980, when it was officially made a part of the GOP plank, in combination with the relationship with the emerging more majority, that's how Reagan got cut his deal. Mm -hmm. Because Reagan was an outsider for a lot of Republicans. That's why he lost in 76. The base didn't like him, and the establishment didn't like him. Mm -hmm. He cut his deals and did that very much as Nixon cut his deal to get disgruntled white Southern men into the party in 68 with his Southern strategy because he wanted to bleed off what what uh, Johnson was doing. And so you you have these, these moments culturally and politically converging in a way in mm -hmm. which the party that once said the government has no role right. in any decision you make between you and your doctor. That's right. In fact, Larry, if you recall, I'll, that I'll, was the cornerstone of the argument I made running against Obamacare in 2010, was <laughs> that the government had no role between you and your doctor in deciding what kind of health care you should have. I will go even further. Here's the point that I, that I made. Um, on abortion, it's interesting that the Republicans have a liberal standpoint yep. and the Democrats have a conservative standpoint because... Uh, the uh, the liberal standpoint, if you think, and I'm talking about ideology, is we believe that the agency of this child is not being protected and the government must intervene to protect the agency of this unborn child. We need government intervention. That is a liberal point of view. Anytime yep. you need government intervention to protect the agency of an individual, that is a liberal point of view. Whereas the Democrats say, no, 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 no. The liberty 
of the woman is the most important that's, issue. A woman's liberty, the liberty to make her own decision. That's a conservative that's idea. That's a conservative that's argument. Not a, that's not a liberal <laughs> argument. That's, it's like the government has no right to interfere with the liberty of this individual. The Constitution protects this person's liberty. Yep. Yep. What does that sound like? <laughs> right? And, now, and what makes this country special more than any other country is respecting individual, individual liberty. liberty correct yes. where have i heard that before i don't correct. know that is Republican a conservative platforms? that is a conservative idea that's not a that's not a liberal idea liberals say no 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 no, no. Yeah. government we need government intervention because the agency of this individual is not being protected yeah. who can protect this yeah yeah. Government has to do that. Government has oh, to thanks. Do that. Thanks, liberals. We appreciate that. <laughs> well, now you know why I, oh, I have gin and tonics at 10 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. But <laughs> people don't realize on abortion, ideology is, is it's, flipped. It's flipped. You know? It's completely flipped. We are having a lot of fun with my buddy Larry Wilmore. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk to him about another change that has come to American television. I think he knows. Maybe he doesn't. Hmm. We'll find out right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the Michael Steele Podcast. I'm having a good time with my man, Larry Wilmore, the host of Black on the Air. Uh, you know him for his work uh, on Blackish, uh, The Fresh Prince, uh, certainly Comic Mac Central. Show. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, man, you're, the Nightly Show, The you're, Daily you're, Show, The Office. The, the that's office. right, The Office. People, yeah. people, yeah, yeah. 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 There's a lot. There's a lot. a lot. This brother's been yeah. working. <laughs> He's been working. <laughs> Insecure. There you it's go. Right. Mm -hmm. So we had we had exciting news. I was really excited uh, when the word hit the street that John mm -hmm. Stewart was coming back at least once a week uh, mm -hmm. to the Daily Show um, on Comedy Central. Um, I even did a little spoof with the Muppet uh and, and just you know sort of just asking the question well maybe we'll see the muppet again who knows maybe the muppet will come back and the little muppet did a little cameo it was a lot of fun but the but it is amazing how john has hit the ground running and sort of real just like before he left and and now in this in this moment putting his finger on Mm -hmm. where the pulse is for a lot of folks what first off what what are your thoughts about john's coming back um and you know do you think this what he will bring will help us uh along with some others out there to sort of contextualize the cultural political moment right now um i think it's great seeing john again i mean he really made that show what it is and influenced so many others including myself you know doing mm -hmm. that he also influenced a lot of people in traditional media who kind of adopted little things that the daily show did back in the day on their own programs and format and that kind of stuff you know um i caught uh first two it looks like he's having a lot of fun yeah <laughs> you know? yeah yeah it looks like he's very happy that he's back and this is you know who does it better than john stewart so uh, if there ever was a time to come back and do it, this election year is probably the time. So I'm I'm happy to see him back. Yeah, it, it you know it's it, the response has been has been strong and it's been fun uh, to just sort of I, I think it's in one sense and it you know it's, obviously it's not a slight on anyone else who, who hosts mm -hmm. the show or anything like that, but when you laugh with him, you kind of laugh differently, and mm -hmm. at least that's how I feel. Mm. Um, and just in terms of the sort of the cultural piece that he brings directly to the screen, you mm -hmm. know, you know, writers like yourself are writing incredibly good scripts that, you know, in, in a lot of cases, other people are saying, unless, mm -hmm. you know, at times when you've had your own show and, and doing your thing, you have that mm -hmm. same opportunity as well. When you're in that position, when you can more directly uh, say yeah. the words yourself, as opposed to writing them, uh, for others, it, it sort of has a different feel, right? Or, oh, yeah. or, or, or oh not. absolutely. And John is, he really is the best at that. Um, if you ever have a chance to see how he puts a show together, he's so friggin' smart, Michael. Yeah. And he has such a good sense of what is the journey of this story, not just jokes. You know, we all have the ability to write jokes because it's what we do for a living. You know, we get, 
you put us in any room, we can come up with jokes for something. Mm -hmm. But jokes is not what John's going after. It's, it's point of view. You know, what is my take? And huh? what what is the journey I'm going to take you on for this take with humor here, that type of stuff? And where where do I want you at the end of this? You know, you got to, and doing that every day. Now he does it once a week. But having to do that every day, and many times you'll go through the day and you're not even sure what your take is until after rehearsal and you go, oh, okay, I get yeah, it. Right. And you, oh, that's and you, what I want to go. Right? Oh, exactly. And then you have like 20 minutes to get this thing right in the rewrite room, you know, and figure it out. And there's nobody better at John than figuring out a take, you know? And right. I think what, what a lot of people confuse with, with what that show is, is I think many times they critique it because they don't agree with John. You know, and I'm like, well, that's not a basis for critique. That's a basis for agreement, you mm -hmm. know. So I can't believe he said this about that. All right, motherfucker, you just you <laughs> disagree with him. You know, it's like, but that's not <laughs> that's not a critique, you know. You know, it's like I disagree with some things John says. I disagree with them when we're on the show, but that doesn't right. mean his point of view isn't valid or interesting or shouldn't be listened to, or you know, so many times like when they call John on both sides and that kind of stuff. So, well, you just disagree with how he's viewing things. That's right. okay. But <laughs> what what about the actual content? You know, is the content valid? Right. <laughs> what, what's your thought on the content of what he's saying? Right, because yeah. many times they'll have an agenda because right. if their agenda is, you know, they want somebody to be elected, how dare you do anything to get in the way of that? Well, that's your that's what you're trying to do. Right, that's Maybe your agenda, that's, it's not mine. That's not his agenda. Right. His agenda is different than yours. You know, yeah. people think that these comedy shows have the magic ability to get people elected or sway elections. If only, Michael, <laughs> if only, you know, <laughs> I don't think if you ask John and I can't speak for him, but if you said, are you doing this show to get Biden elected? What do you think he's going to say? Oh, he probably cuss you out. He's gonna say, "Motherfucker, absolutely not!" You know, <laughs> yeah, are you I kidding me? That's, right. that's not. He doesn't work for the DNC. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, because they're not that funny. I'm no, sorry. none of them are funny. <laughs> <They're not laughs> that funny. Now <laughs> we're less that, funny on my side. <laughs> now John certainly is a liberal, and I'm sure he'd like to see them be elected. And he's gonna point out, you know, he wants that to happen, but the purpose of a show is not that, you know. Because John has more integrity than just that. He's not, that's not what he's trying to do in his show. So sometimes you may, like I used to say this to people, I said, one of the reasons why I called myself a passionate centrist, I said, because sometimes I'll disagree with myself, you know? <laughs> well, I do. No, man. <laughs> actually, I, Larry, that's, a, that's an excellent point to make because I don't think people really appreciate that's part of the evolution of the mind and the soul, meaning mm -hmm. the you know the things you think about and the things you care about. Right. Because the reality is, if you don't have that evolution, if you don't challenge your own thinking, mm -hmm. right, you begin to sound like a lot of the numb nuts on my side. The first step to learning is acknowledging that you don't know. Bingo. <laughs> you know, Bingo. And that there is a possibility you may be wrong just, about something. Just, just, you know? it, and it makes oh, a little small one. Might be wrong. How do I fix being wrong? Start <laughs> listening is would be one thing. You know, consider another opinion. Be oh, what is open-minded? What does that really mean? What does that know? mean? Yeah. It, it, it's funny because it, for me, as someone who has, you know, been a public official uh, and groomed a lot of public officials, advised them, the one thing I always tell them, it really steps into what you're saying is, first off, um, you, you've, got, you've got to be uh, open about what's going around on mm -hmm. around you. My mama put it this way, just shut up and listen. That's what she mm -hmm. always used to tell me, just shut up and listen. But the other thing I would tell, uh, and I still do, tell young candidates to be, and, and those, even, even some more senior ones, is go to the bathroom and stand in front of the mirror and talk to the person in front of you mm -hmm. and listen to what they say. And if you're not grounded in, in, in the belief of those words and, 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 and sort of coming to grips with what they mean, just go sit on the toilet and work it out. And then mm -hmm. and then, then before you come out into the world and think you're going to represent me or represent a community of people or represent a country, 
We don't want you to bring your ish and figure that stuff out on our watch. We want you to at least have some bearing as, as to who you are. And it really does go to the heart of, you know, what you were saying there is, is that you, you, you've got to be open right. to and learning it's... more about yourself and take that occasional trip to the bathroom and have a conversation. And Michael, two things can be true at one time. You can acknowledge something isn't perfect, but still be for it. You know, like, for instance... We can acknowledge that Biden is old, I would argue too old, right. you know, and has slowed down a lot, you know, and we have concerns about his cognitive ability maybe to be president. And on the other side, he's running against a treasonous kind of dumb ra uh, rapist, you know, I mean, that's hello. <laughs> and if I were if I were for Trump, I would be forced to say, well, it, it's OK that he's a rapist and tried to overturn the government. I'm cool with that, you know, but right. But here's what, I, here's what I like, as opposed to, no, he didn't do that. Mm, I think you need to acknowledge that. So yeah. if I if I were voting for Trump, I would have to say, yeah, I guess I'm OK that he's that and that because I like these policies. Thank right. God I don't, I don't have that dilemma. I, I would, But I don't mind. It doesn't threaten me if somebody says, Biden's too old. Like, how dare you say you can't say that? It's the truth. It's Let the me. truth. It's Stop the truth. it. It is the truth. The best thing that Biden could have done in my estimation was last summer say, guys, I wanted to come in here and get us back on the right track, shake things up, but I'm opening the door to the youth of this party. I want, you know, I think there's a whole new generation that, you know, needs to have a shot at this, whether it's my vice president or other people on deck. I don't care who it is. I'll support whoever the winner is, but I'm doing that right now. Do you know how popular he would be? He would be so popular right now. Yeah. Like there would be a fire under whoever that candidate is right now. The thing yeah. that I didn't mean to go off on this tangent, but this no, is what it's, kills it's, me. The the thing that the the Democrats are missing right now is fire under their candidate, you know. And ironically, the treasonous rapist has fire under him. You know, people feel like that election was stolen from Trump the last time. There's yeah, there's you know, and they really like him a lot, you know. And the the people who are going to be voting for Trump have energy. Then the all the Biden energy is still kind of anti-Trump, but it's not as strong anti-Trump as it was. The last time, you know. Yeah, no, so that's a good point. Democrats I mean, have a I, lot of a lot of big issues now. There are a lot of big issues, I, you know, and I agree with you uh, about what could have happened last summer, or probably should have happened last summer. Opportunity missed. Opportunity missed, but you know, at the same time, um, you know, short of having a, a real good reason, I've never known anyone to walk away from the presidency. And and so you don't well walk. except LBJ who we mentioned earlier. But he had a real good reason. Yeah, he had a real good reason, and that's because he'd lost he'd lost enough of his base to know that he couldn't go forward. And that's because you know the Republicans weren't as manic as they are now. And that, I think that's the thing to your point. Kind of holds holds some of most of that still in place for for Biden. And he leveraged into that, quite honestly. And, and so um, now you're at, at this point where um, here you are. And my attitude is, OK, give me the 81 year old guy who may be a little bit slow, but at least he's not planning to use the Constitution as a roll of toilet paper. Um, right. And uh, I also, I also you know. think it's, it's not our job to do this for him. He needs to reach out to people, yeah. like especially to the youth. Yeah. The left youth of the country and yeah. be a leader in getting them on board and not yeah. just leave it up to us to do all the work to say, oh, no, he's OK, you guys. You know, right. It's like, right. What happened to your job in this? You know, <laughs> how, come, well, I, how come you're not reaching out to us? Right, right. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, and so I, I would before I let you go, I, I, I want to touch on something that I thought was uh, important that you said, and it really leans into the point you just made. You had an opportunity to speak to um, the class of 2023, um, and you uh, last year and well, at Harvard, mm -hmm. and, right? And you made the point to them: "quote Fear is usually the culprit that prevents us from doing the things in life that we are meant to do, but are afraid to do for whatever reason. Though it can uh, come from anywhere, the most paralyzing type of fear." always starts inside of us. I, I, I thought that is that speaks to what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, even as someone um, 
at, at, at Biden's age can be paralyzed by that fear, fear of walking away, fear mm-hmm. of giving up on, on this moment, transitioning uh, authority and power to someone else. Or in the case of the next generation, um, fear that they're not ready, fear that they're not capable, um, mm-hmm. um, fear that they're not the person that they want to be. And I, I just think, talk a little bit about the lesson that you 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 wanted to impart to them and that, you know, those listening should take away from addressing and being honest about those fears. Well, fear can come in many forms. There could be different things that you're afraid of. Um, let me project something that I used to be afraid of that I think I can relate to Joe Biden on. This is going to be surprising to some people. So um, one of the interesting things that Joe Biden um, um, acknowledged, and I don't remember when, was that he was a stutterer, mm-hmm. you know, for most of his life, you know. And I had a bad problem when I was a kid from stuttering. I remember there's, I'm a mimic and there was a kid who stuttered and I couldn't stop mimicking him, but then it became my problem. And I was always self-conscious about it. And there were certain sentences I couldn't start sometimes that they had certain vowels or that type of thing, right. or certain words I'd get stuck on. And I'd be very embarrassed in public sometimes trying to say certain things. And then I just wouldn't say anything or I would, I'd have to choose a different word. I get stuck in the middle of something. It was, very self-conscious about it, you know. Even to this day, it flashes through my mind when I'm stuck on certain words. I think Joe Biden has a fear of public speaking that relates to his stuttering. I really do. Yeah. And I and I think many of the issues that he has, and if you watch them carefully, I see it because I know what it is. It's starting sentences and it's it's a it's a physical thing, yep. not a cognitive thing. Yep. And I think if he was more honest about that. And really talk to people about it because it's it's very it, it allows us to get into him a little more. It says, guys, look, I have a problem with words sometimes. <laughs> you know, I, I I get stuck. You know, and talk to us about that problem because it's a very human issue, and we could really relate to it. And then when you see him, here's how you're changing the narrative. He's talking about a fear that he has. You mm-hmm. know, he's addressing it to us. We can relate to it because many people have done it. Even if we can't, we are relating to him as a person. When Now when he would stumble or have that thing, we know what it is. Right. is. We're not right. making things up in our head about he's stupid. He's seen now. He's not. No, you know what? It's not easy for him to right. you know, have certain words fall together sometimes or start certain things. And sometimes you have to replace words. When you're a stutterer, sometimes you have to replace words that aren't necessarily the best word for the word that you want to say right you know i'm not giving him this an excuse an excuse on that but i can recognize some of those things when i see him talking because i've gone through it and i know it's a fear that you have not like you know big fear right but it's one of those things that it kind of haunts you your whole life because you're just self-conscious about it you know and i remember when he talked about that i was so happy he brought it up you know um, and I remember seeing things online about people who had the same issue and they were discussing it. And I was like, wow, this is powerful. You know, talk about the things that you're vulnerable about, yeah. the things that, that are hard for you to do. Because the way to really attack your fears, you have to go straight at them and kind of put sunlight on them, you know, and you have to take the power away from those things that you're afraid of. Now, when I'm speaking to the students, a lot of those things are their future, you know, the things that they have to go after. And some of the fears are about those types of things. And you know, I talked about that summer when I had to knock on doors and the way to get over the fear of knocking on the door, I was selling books over the door, was to actually knock on the door. On the door. You know? <laughs> yeah, it, was, it wasn't going, sitting on the couch, having psychology, talking right, to psychiatrists. Right. It was, it was it an happened. action. Right. So actions are very powerful, you know, and the action of sharing your fear with people many times can open you up to having a better relationship with that thing because it's never going to go away, but it's your relationship with it that is the thing that gives you the power over it. So a little thing about fear. Larry Wilmore. Uh, appreciate that story, man. It, it's, I agree with you a thousand percent on, on that, that sort of vulnerable side of Joe Biden. He does it in other ways, but I think yeah. that, that, that is a level of connective tissue that I think people, yeah, 
can really kind of oh wow okay that makes sense now to me yeah and, and they, we don't they, know a lot we don't know a lot about them really Michael. yeah we don't yeah. you know you really in don't terms, I mean, in terms of being let in you know obama he had a natural ability to make people feel that way you know and right. the way he talked about michelle and malia and you know his kids and everything uh trump it's all about him so <laughs> right uh you know uh Bill Clinton made it seem like you were the most important person. Right. So right. it was a little different, you know. He, right. You know, I feel your pain. You know, that was different. So right. we were in a flattering relationship with him, which was right. different. Exactly. You know, tell me more. Tell me more. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but I think Biden needs us to, we need to understand him more. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And then, and, you know, you, that's, that's an odd thing to say, you know, three and a half years into his term. You know, I, my, my, Criticism was it was a presidency without a president. That was my criticism early on. Interesting. You know? yeah. Interesting. <laughs> That's that sounds like the title of a book. Hmm. There you go. There you go. Larry, I appreciate you, man. Thanks for coming by and spending. My pleasure. It's fun. It's really, it's really good to to catch up with you and to get your insights on things. And uh what what are you working on right now before we go that we should be paying attention to or watching out for? Several projects. One that's uh, continuing is a show called Reasonable Doubt. It's on Hulu. I produce it with Kerry Washington. We're filming the second season right now. It's a, one of those soapy thrillers, which I people love associate with me, but it's really so much fun. Um, most of the stuff I'm developing is over at NBC right now. I got a few things in the hopper. Um, there's a, a limited series I'm working on for Peacock. We're trying to get done. It's about uh, Richard Pryor, Flip Wilson, Dick Gregory, and Red Fox when they were first trying to make it and that's so much fun I, I hope people get to see that because oh, we're, wow. Having, we're wow. having a lot of fun putting that together right wow, now wow man yeah. that talk about legends oh, Michael, it'd be so much fun. yeah yeah so that's that's a project i'm really looking forward to a couple of other things too and people i'm working with so oh, man. A, lot, a lot of irons in the fire right now and my podcast black in the air and thanks for that's it that. black on, black on the air man i appreciate you very much for being black on the air with me so yes my <laughs> pleasure michael thank you sir all right my friend take care that does it for this time together folks god bless y'all out there uh, check out Larry on Instagram and threads and X at Larry Wilmore. Definitely check out the podcast Black on the Air. Well, Larry Wilmore, colon, Black on the Air. And, um, uh, you know, give him some love and downloads and do the same for for your for your friend here. You know, I'm just a poor little peasant. For your boy. For, for your, your boy. boy just Michael. trying to catch up with the men. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> Just trying to catch up with the men. Until <laughs> next time, y'all take care.